Well hello and a warm welcome back to the plot. Um, it is Sunday morning as is traditional. It's uh, quarter past six. Sunrise was 6.02 and um, August is an untidy month on the plot. It is in the garden as well. Things go over, everything starts to flop and droop. Um, <laughs> it's an age thing. Um, so um, you know I've learned to live with that. I, I don't worry about it. The main thing is the primary concern is harvesting and it is a wonderful time and despite the difficult start to the year this year is proving to be just as good as any other when it comes to harvest for me. I hope it is for you. So I'm going to do an August plot tour today. Uh, I've got a few other things to talk to you about. Some funny, some not. Um, but uh, you're very welcome so let's start with that plot tour. Well I'm starting down the bottom corner um, and the reason for that is those pumpkins are coming on a tree in that wheelbarrow. For some reason the, the plant hasn't left the wheelbarrow. Normally a pumpkin sends out a leader and they, you know, they start to run away but it hasn't. Odd. Anyway, there are three good sized pumpkins in that wheelbarrow and one of them is starting to turn a yellowy orange which is nice to see. The, uh, the fig has some good size fruit on it. First time ever, so I'm hopeful these two plants, pumpkin charmant that were excess uh, plants I had left over, I stuck them in and hope for the best. Well, I've got one good sized pumpkin on each. Uh, anything else that starts to develop as a fruit, I will chop off because it, there's not enough time now um, to develop into a pumpkin. And here's something that's strange. I saved my own seed. The, the main pumpkin I've got here is called Charmont. It's your classic um, Halloween pumpkin. Bright orange, you know, the size, you know, really good size. Um, and they, they're, they're green and then they, you know, about now they start to turn yellow into a final orange colour. But this year, this is what they're doing. They start off yellow and then that green slowly makes its way up the plant and you know to green and I'm assuming it will then go orange there's one there that is doing the same that's really strange I've never had that before anyway it's one to watch yeah I wonder if that's something to do with me, me using my own saved seed I don't know maybe if you know you could leave a comment main crop potatoes Java and Cara um, so the plants are still looking good. Rhubarb looks fantastic. More pumpkins. The ones here are called zombie. I'm not sure how big they're going to get. They do look very ugly suitably, but they don't seem to be growing very big. Of course, when you see the picture on the packet, it doesn't have a scale. Anyway. The carrot tubs are full of weeds, I'm going to pick some of those today. And that Granny Smith apple, the apples are covered in some sort of scab. But um, it's a shame because, you know, I'd like them to look nicer than they do. But I'm going to juice all those so the, the outside skin doesn't really matter too much. This um, blackberry still making good fruit. There we are. That's a, you know, they're all that size. It's fantastic. Moving on to the main plot. Um, compost heaps. My working heap at the end there is full. And I shall be coming back and speaking about that. That's a job for today. All these beds are looking full. I'm going to, I'm letting the sweet peas go brown and I shall save my own seed. Picking lots of French beans and runner beans. And shock horror, I have an empty bed. I used the last of the beetroot from that bed uh, this week. So I have an empty bed, but not for long. I'll talk about that again. That's a job that coincides with the work I've got to do in the compost heaps. Right, moving on through. The peas are finished and I've saved all my seed. I just haven't got the time at the moment to dismantle all this and... I'm going to bury this stuff in the ground. 
tomatoes just about I'm going to take a good picking today Cheryl's going to make a tomato sauce for the winter and I've got enough here for her to do that so they are just starting you can see there just starting to turn now we're well into August on I'm, I'm, one of the another job for today is I'm going to cut all the leaves um, and the top growth off so this one I shall chop here because they outdoors at the end of August are never going to make fruit so there's no point the plant putting all that effort into all this growth here when I just want it to ripen the fruit so all that's coming off today all this top growth moving on up I've got a few leeks starting to bolt so these have had good water today these are crimson blush they're a beefsteak tomato blight resistant they are huge I just need them to ripen Moving up a bit further, ah yes, Brussels sprouts. This is Crispus, it's club root resistant, which is the only type I grow because we've got club root. And my main complaint with Crispus has in the past been, uh, they're a little bit early and I want them for Christmas obviously, and they're tiny, they're like tiny little marbles. However, this year they're whoppers. I have to say, I mean that one at the bottom is looks like a small cabbage rather than a, a large Brussels sprout. I have put a lot of effort into watering them this year, which has clearly um, reaped benefits. And I know I said that these winter squash mashed potatoes are bush types, they don't trail, but they've actually managed to shut off that path for me. But um, lots of fruit. Oh, I do want to go back to the butternuts. Yeah, the butternut squash. Um, we have had good years in the past, but I think this year could be our best ever. They're all very good size. Um, it, there's nine in a cluster just here. So if that's carried on throughout the whole bed, it's going to be a bumper year. And here is another example of what I'm talking about. That fruit there will probably make it. It's mid-August, so there's just about enough time, I think. However, where it's leading on, and you see there's a tiny little fruit there. This leader is all coming off today because it's a waste of effort on the plant's part because that is never going to become a butternut by the end of the season. We just don't have the summer for it. Um, these strawberry plants were all chopped right down so there was virtually nothing showing. They've all grown back, uh, it was only a few weeks ago, and if that, certainly it was in August I did it, and they're putting on more growth, they've got flowers and a couple have got strawberries, it's incredible. And do you see what I mean about the verbena bonariensis that are growing? All self-seeded, I haven't put them there, obviously. And they're not only are they self-seeded, but they're flowering. Yeah, fantastic. The chard is magnificent. Again, it's bolting, but I keep watering it. Um, and that goes in our green juices that we have probably once or twice a week. Cheryl hates them. I mean, they're not good tasters. <laughs> but um, they're incredibly powerful and good for you. Um, right. Yeah, the winter squash mashed potato. Lots of them. And they make quite a bit of money at the farm shop. I have people down the farm shop who, um, when they see me go down there with my produce, they say, oh, are you growing the mashed potatoes this year? Last year they were gutted because I didn't. So um, I should be able to tell them the good news this year. Up the top here, excuse my shadow, more leaks and more bolting um, however if, if that's all that bolts as we move towards autumn then we'll get a good crop I mean they're certainly big enough to start harvesting um, yeah kale cavolo nero haven't touched that yet um, it's more of a winter crop um, the, the flower bed I mean, it, the, again, the verbena looks fantastic, but I need to sort this out next year, if next year is viable. Um, I think I'm going to buy some uh, 
dahlias and just grow them for cut flowers. Um, and the last thing I want to show you is this mess here. The uh, spinach, New Zealand spinach, is overflowing, which is lovely. For some reason, oh, I've got a blackberry that I don't want growing out from under the shed. And the um, kiwi plant has just decided to go mad. It's twirled its way around the chimney, which obviously it, it can't do. So I need to train that in somehow. Still no fruit, but lots and lots of growth this year. So this is all a bit of a mess and that needs sorting today. And these bits of thin ply are for this last path down the edge that I'm going to be doing. I won't do that till the autumn because it's quite a job. But as the sun comes up on this beautiful Sunday, mid-August, it's all looking good and there's lots to harvest. So let's have a look at some other jobs. So here's my jobs for today in this order. Um, I tidied up that bed um, sometime during the week and I'm going to replant it. And if I can bring you around slowly, this compost, allotment made compost, was turned on the 8th of April and it's been sat there since and it looks like reasonable stuff. So that is coming out. I'm going to put it through this homemade sieve and put a top dressing on that bed that I've just showed you. Planting it with more beetroot that I've got, I've brought up from home today. And this lot here is going into there. That's quite a job. So that's the first and top priority for today. Uh, another job is all this rather old and tatty looking comfrey. I'm going to chop that down. There's more of it up there with nettles. I'm going to keep those with it, chop all that down, and that's going on that compost heap that I'm going to create. And this hedge here, which actually belongs to the golf driving range, but I look after the top of this because it um, puts my crops in the shade if I don't. So I'm going to chop that at some point today with my hedge trimmer. So there's another job to clear all this lot. I alluded to it on the plot tour but another job today, I'm going to cut this spinach so that it's back into its raised bed. I'm going to cut that blackberry out. It shouldn't be there because there's two cold frames in there. There's a load of stinging nettles coming through the water barrels there. That needs pulling out. Um, and then I've got to do something, tie in the um, kiwi plant and get it off the roof of the shed. So yeah, that... If, if I've got time, that's another job for today. Well, that's um, it's nice to see, that's proper no dig. My own inch or two of sieved allotment compost and then the new beetroot plants which I sowed about a month ago, um, straight in there, watered, and let's hope the slugs, because of the dry weather, stay clear. Right, next job. Right, that bay's empty now, and the excess I've put on various beds where there's space. If anyone is wondering what this 
shipping containers doing here. It used to be over on the far side, about three or four hundred metres away, and it's basically a garage for the driving range's large uh, sit-on mower. But the new owner has had it moved here because you can't get over there because the ground is so wet in the winter. So he's filled this space here. Um, it's a bit of an inconvenience to me. It's shading the trees, but um, it is his land, so there's not a lot I can do about it. And it is an eyesore, but so be it. Well, I think what you need in your life is a bit of useless information. So, the first woman to play golf was Mary, Queen of Scots. And a piece of UI that I know is that she spoke French and she used to have an army cadet uh, as a, a sort of a, an aide. And when she whacked a golf ball across the field, she would shout, cadet, cadet, which was French for cadet, um, which is where the word caddy comes from. Not a lot of people know that. Agatha Christie was a keen surfer. George W. Bush was a college cheerleader. Aren't they women? Bruce Lee was Hong Kong's 1958 cha-cha dance champion. Didn't know that. The oldest dance still performed is the Austrian shoe slapping dance. I don't know if I could... That, you know, you know the one. Oh, I think I put my back out. The oldest animal ever found was a 405 year old Icelandic clam. It was killed by researchers trying to work out its age. <laughs> oh, gotta love that. We <laughs> right, for the ladies in the audience, pay attention. Women look their oldest at 3.30 p.m. on Wednesdays. <laughs> Who works that out? How do you judge, you know, anyway. N new deastertion means relating to the day before yesterday. It's not a word you're going to ever use, is it? The word journey is from the French journée and once meant the distance one could walk in a day. The Swahili for journey is safari. The Express, the Telegraph, the Economist, the Times, the Star and the Independent were all London-based stagecoaches in the 1830s. And that's where the newspaper names come from. How interesting. The solar system is travelling round the galaxy at more than half a million miles per hour. Gee. A Manx shearwater, which is a bird, flies over five million miles in its lifetime. Zugenruhe is the restlessness of caged birds in the migration season. How sad is that? Urban birds... <laughs> I've met a few of them in my time. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I digress. Urban, urban birds have learnt to line their nests with cigarette butts. Nicotine is a powerful insecticide that wards off mites, lice and fleas. The nectar of citrus plants contains caffeine to attract bees. David Cameron, who was an ex-Prime Minister if you're not in the UK, used to be president of the Oxfordshire Beekeepers Association. Panage, if you're in the New Forest you'll know this, Panage was a tax on keeping pigs in royal forests that was paid in pigs. Henry VIII put a tax on beards in 1535 but made sure his own was exempt. Here's an interesting fact. The British government have just taken the um, two or three hundred pound heating allowance off all the old age pensioners but made sure that MPs who get a heating allowance, were exempt. you got to love them, haven't you? Yes, I think that'll do for today. That's your little um, helping of useless information to get you through the week. And for the ladies amongst you, good luck with Wednesday at 3.30. <laughs> Thank you.
well I'm sweating profusely and puffing that was hard work but anything worthwhile is so I just got to relabel that as when it was turned whatever the date is today I know Wednesday's the 21st today's Sunday I should be able to do the maths <laughs> I'll sit down and think about that later. Um, anyway, this bay is almost empty and what's left in the bottom is actually usable. So I'm going to wheelbarrow that somewhere as well. And this will now be my working heap. But what is fascinating is as I went down through the various layers, and of course, as you get deeper, it turns into better stuff. You could see the industry of the rats that lived in here. I don't know whether they rush out when I go in or whether they've left a, a while ago but they've moved all the straw and dry material into one area of the heap as a nest. The runner beans, the courgettes, the French beans, etc. The beetroot that I'd thrown in at various stages, they pulled into one place as a food store. They are so industrious. You do have to admire them. Um, so, yeah, just got to put that somewhere and move on to the next job cover that and let that carry on. Well, it's not perfect, but it's a lot neater, and I'm keeping that hedge down. Right, cold frames. Oh, that is so much better and I've had to cut off, cut off a lot of the spinach but as you can see there's still plenty left. When I first started my channel I sort of married the allotment with a lot of the health stuff I'd looked into and it's only just a personal hobby I have no expertise at all um, I just do a lot of reading and watching and I've said in the past you know it, I was very conventional in my beliefs 
and uh, the more I read, the more I discovered everything I'd been told, everything that was a socially accepted fact was wrong. And of course, nowadays, we're not surprised to hear that. But I just want to mention, there's, there's a good friend of mine who um, is having health issues. In his, he's in his 70s. He's got multiple health issues, one of which is heart disease. And, you know, we've spoke at length about it. He, he approached me. I would never uh, deem to tell him what to do with his life and his medical problems. But he asked me what I thought. So I told him. Um, and he, you know, he said what many people said. Oh, yeah, Martin, I understand that makes a lot of sense, but I couldn't do that. Um, you know, it, it's interesting. I, you know, if I had bad health like that, I'd do whatever it took. O other than conventional medicine, I would never go near um, conventional medicine. And I'll, I'll tell you why. There's two kinds of problems that we have in our health. One is acute, one is chronic. Acute is an accident, uh, a car crash. You spill boiling water on your arm, something like that. When you have an acute problem, the NHS and modern Western medicine is the only place to go. They are superb at what they do. Chronic diseases, diseases of lifestyle and diet, they are less than useless. They have no idea, clueless. And I know that sounds strong, but I've spent a lot of time looking at it and I've, a lot of my customers are elderly and they go to the NHS and their problems get worse and worse, progressive and more progressive, and they take more and more pills and the pills have, you know, and you know this, you know the score. Anyway, I want, I read a, a bit from a, a document recently about heart disease. And heart disease is the biggest killer in the West, although cancer, dementia and all these others are trying their best to overtake uh, heart disease. You and I are most, statistically, most likely to die of heart disease. Um, and of course the NHS says it's, um, it's not curable, which is not true. Um, I would, this is in two parts. The first is about conventional medicine and the route you take if you go to a modern Western doctor and how completely useless it is and they can't cure it, etc, etc. I'm not going to read it because this platform will shut me down and tell me that it's contravening their community guidelines. So I'm not going to read that bit. You know, you know how ineffective modern medicine is. And if you don't, well, then, you know, you'll follow the conventional route. Conventional route, conventional outcome. Of course, there is an alternative route. Dr. Caldwell Esselstein, the lead cardiovascular surgeon. So he was a conventional heart surgeon doing all the conventional heart operations and realised he was making no difference and having no effect on the final outcomes cardiovascular surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic in the United States enrolled 24 patients in a study in 1985. 24 of them. They had collectively experienced 49 cardiovascular events, 15 cases of angina, 13 cases of disease progression, 7 bypass surgeries, 4 heart attacks, 3 strokes, 2 angioplasties and 2 worsening stress tests. Five of these people had been told their condition was so severe there was nothing more to be done, they were sent home to die. He put them on a strict plant-based diet. Their cholesterol lowered from an average of 246 milligrams per something or other to below 150 milligrams. The disease progression stopped and began to reverse. Angina was eliminated exercise capacity increased and sexual function restored. Six people found the diet too hard and left the program. These six people went on to have four cases of angina, two cases of congestive heart failure and one death. Between the remaining 18 not one further cardiac event occurred and they have never taken drugs again. The five terminal cases are still alive today and disease free. Now I know we all love the N this is my bit. I know we all love the NHS and we all trust our doctor. But honestly, why is there no conversation in society, the media or in healthcare? More importantly, why do doctors not outline these options before referring you to a cardiologist? Many anyway, I'll go on, but I'm not going to carry on with that. Now I know because my friend 
is an example that you can tell them all that and you can I say go and read the science and I gave him the reference and he did read it to his credit but he won't do it and I'll tell you why because it requires effort it requires change you have to take responsibility for yourself and your own health whereas if you go the conventional route you can carry on doing all the stuff that got you there in the first place swallow a pill and think everything's good which of course it isn't but so I know that if you told most people what I've just read they'd go hmm I don't think so and that's fine it's your choice but I think a lot of people might just say oh that's you know why would you go you know anyway quite interesting Well, another Sunday, another harvest. What I particularly like about this one is the variety. And there's so much more I could have harvested, but um, little and often, I think, is the way. Excellent. A good day. I say it every time I know. I do enjoy these Sundays. Uh, Bridget was up on her plot. She's diagonally opposite me. I saw her mooching about for an hour. Um, but other than that, I've had the sight to myself. Um, just a, a sort of postscript to the Caldwell Esselstyn story. It's not surprising I always remember that name. Um, is that once he'd done that study and had those people have such success, he offered a programme to um, his hospital and to, to, to do a plant-based diet and to put people and offer it to people who had heart disease and to give them the same opportunity these other people had and the hospital turned him down he said no that's not something we're interested in further to that you know a couple of years later some of the cardiologists got heart disease you know that, that tells you something doesn't it if you spend your life as a cardiologist and you get heart disease you clearly don't know your back end from your elbow do you Anyway, they came to Caldwell Esselstein and asked to do his program. So the hospital wasn't interested uh, because, of course, you know, heart disease makes money. All those incredibly complex uh, operations, you know, it's fantastic revenue. Imagine if the whole of the Western world overnight gave up all the junk, all the animal products and ate a plant based diet. The medical industry would collapse. Anyway. Just a postscript to, to that um, fascinating story. Um, I would also just like to say that um, our eldest son, David, who lives in um, Yellowknife in Canada, his partner is, is pregnant and today is her due date. So, Nikki, <laughs> if you're flat on your back, we wish you well. We're thinking of you um, and I hope, well, Cheryl and I hope it goes well. And we look forward to hearing some good news soon. Um, I won't be around next weekend because it's our other grandchild George's um, first birthday this week. So we're going up next weekend to help to celebrate that occasion. Not that he'll know anything about it. Um, so I shall see you in a fortnight. Enjoy your gardens. Here in the UK we're having a wonderful month. Um, it's been fantastic. Normally the school holidays are a washout. But this year, um, the sun has shone. So enjoy your gardens. Thank you for watching. Thanks to all those who've subscribed. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in a fortnight. Until then, look after yourselves. Take care. Bye for now.